My third point, let me deal with uh, religious extremism, segregationist thinking. Mr. D'Souza spoke about this. The older generation who are getting increasingly older will remember the turmoil of the 50s and 60s. We don't want to go back to those days. For many countries, that is their current reality. What we have today, the racial religious harmony, has been achieved through decades of deliberate, sustained intervention and the government working hand in hand with various stakeholders. It's a constant work in progress. You never say you have arrived and you can slide back quite quickly. So how do we prevent segregationist teachings from taking root? We have a number of uh, approaches, social intervention, regulatory framework, uh, and uh, constant uh, working with community organizations, grassroots, getting the message across. For example, in terms of social intervention, or ethnic integration policy in our public housing. Our schools are integrated. National Service puts our young men together. These deliberate interventions mean that we grow up together, build collective memories together, and we come together as Singaporeans instead of forming ethnic or religious enclaves. And this shows in the way we live our daily lives, such as eating together at the same table, working together in the same offices. One example of the approach, or the result of the approach, Straits Times recently featured Masjid Khalid, a mosque in Juchiat, which distributes oranges and greeting cards to business owners and residents in the area during Lunar New Year. It's just one of the many examples we see on the ground. We have to preserve the harmony. And to do this, we cannot let extremist, segregationist teachings infiltrate our communities. Even a small number of persons propagating radical segregationist beliefs can be dangerous. As Mr. Chong Ki Hyung pointed out, inflammatory viral potential of such beliefs is increased with social media. It is challenging, but we work closely with community groups, religious organizations. We want to try and better inoculate our community from such influences. And the efforts extend to online as well. For example, the Religious Rehabilitation Group has produced online videos to explain why ISIS's ideology goes against Islamic teachings. Offline, uh, in the physical world, when we have foreign preachers who want to come into Singapore, and if we know that they have advocated violence or spread ill will towards other religions, whether in Singapore or elsewhere, they will not be allowed to speak here. This applies to all religions. September of last year, we banned two foreign preachers, Christian. They wanted to speak in Singapore. One of them had described Allah as a false god. He had asked for prayers for those held captive in the darkness of Islam. He insinuated that Buddhists were lost people who could be saved by converting to Christianity. The other preacher had variously referred to the malevolent nature of Islam and Muhammad, saying Islam was not a religion of peace. This is all unacceptable. And we said, no, they cannot come in to preach. That was September 2017. A month later, in October 2017, we said no to two foreign Muslim preachers. One was uh, Mufti Ismail Mank, and the other is Haslin Baharim. Uh, they wanted to come into Singapore to preach on a religious-themed cruise. Some have said that the government overreacted. What is wrong with Mufti Meng telling Muslims that wishing non-Muslims Merry Christmas or Happy Deepavali is the biggest sin and crime that a Muslim can commit? What's wrong with him preaching that? Our decisions are carefully considered. Mufti Meng is a preacher who has been systematically putting out messages like, there are people who are very big enemies of Islam and if you attend their functions, you will be seen as rubbing shoulders with them. 
There are thousands of reasons why Islam is more authentic and valuable. That Christianity is just a bubble that is blown such that you feel emotionally high. If you look at all his teachings, the main message that comes out is quite clear, and the divisiveness is not acceptable. At the same time, we are also not immune to Islamophobia. June of last year, after the news of the detention of uh, Shakaiza Zaral Ansari was reported, we had an Indian man scolding a Muslim lady who wore a tudum on a bus saying that Muslims should stay in Iraq as they did not the value of staying in Singapore. So far, these incidents are few and far between. They are contained. Most Singaporeans don't behave like this. And there's a good reason why. It's because of the approach of the government and the people of Singapore. But we need to keep close watch on this. We must not allow the threat of terrorism to on the other side, breed fear, suspicion, and distrust of each other. Mr. Chong Ki Hyung spoke about the role of the community. Our community leaders have done much to foster respect and understanding between the communities. The IRCCs is one example. The IROs is another. Our religious leaders play a big role in leading by example. A wonderful example is the Mufti of Singapore. Dr. Mohammad Fatris Bakram, who shares in other communities celebrations like Deepavali and Christmas, and regularly offers festive greetings in private and public, including Chinese New Year last month. Another example is the Anglican Bishop, Renes Ponaya, who hosted an annual Christmas tea at his official residence, not just Anglicans attending, there were Catholics, Lutherans, Muslims, Buddhists, Taoists. They were invited to join in, and they joined in. The Singapore Buddhist Lodge donates rice and funds to mosques during Ramadan every year for the breaking of fast to be distributed to needy families. This was initiated by the late president, Mr. Lee Bok Guan, both to help the needy and to promote interreligious harmony. The, there are numerous examples. I've just identified a few. It is the respect of different faiths the willingness to share in each other's lives that nurtures a harmonious, common living space.